This video presents an overview of the concept of pipelining in modern CPUs, along with the hazards that can prevent a pipeline from operating at maximum efficiency. In modern CPUs, instruction processing is typically broken up into smaller steps and independent hardware units are used to perform each step in instruction processing. Typically, there are four key steps in instruction processing, namely instruction fetch, decode, execute, and write back. And the CPU processes instructions in the cycle. First, instructions are fetched from memory by the instruction fetch unit. Next, the instruction is decoded to figure out what type of operation the instruction is performing. Then the ALU actually performs the task and generates outputs and the outputs or results from the instructions are stored back into memory for the next instruction to use. And this cycle keeps repeating and the CPU continues to process instructions in a program one instruction at a time. Now let's look at it from a hardware perspective. Let's say the program has several instructions. Um, here there are some example instructions that use names of registers like ECX, EDX. Think of these are temporary variables in a program. Without pipelining, conceptually, instruction processing is done one instruction at a time. So first, the instruction fetch unit will work and fetch an instruction. Next, the decode unit will decode the instruction to figure out what the instruction needs to do, and so on. Notice that when these instructions are being processed, only one unit is doing the work, and the rest of the hardware is idling, which is not efficient in terms of power or the hardware resources that we have, or the time or speed with which the program runs. And this is an issue that pipelining addresses. So for example, let's look at a general conceptual view of how instructions are executed. So when given several instructions, first instruction one will start, so the fetch of instruction one will occur, then the instruction one is decoded, then it's executed, and the results are stored back in memory as part of the write back stage. Next, instruction 2 will be fetched from memory, it will be decoded, executed, and the results will be stored back in memory. Then instruction 3 will be fetched, it will be decoded, executed, and the results are stored back. And this cycle continues. So if each one of these little stages takes, say, k milliseconds, usually it's in nanoseconds, then each instruction takes about 4k time units to be processed, and the time taken for three instruction, it will be 12k milliseconds. This is just basic math. Now let's look at the scenario where the CPU is designed from the ground up to use pipelining. So we're going to look at the same instructions. But here with pipelining, what happens is the execution of different instruction stages is overlapped and the hardware continues to work on different instructions. So first instruction one is fetched and the fetch unit works, but then when it moves to the decode, the fetch unit gets the next instruction and the pipeline keeps processing instructions and different stages in the hardware process different instructions and the instruction continues to flow through the CPU, thereby keeping all of the stages busy and effectively using the hardware. Let's look at this from a graphical uh, perspective. So when instruction I1 is being fetched, instruction, instruction uh, I1 starts decoding, instruction I2 is being fetched from memory by a different hardware unit. Next, when instruction 1 is being executed by a different hardware unit, instruction 2 is decoded by the previous hardware unit, while instruction 3 is being fetched from memory. And this operation happens continuously processing instructions where each stage of the instruction processing is done by a different hardware unit, and the CPU continues to process different instructions, keeping all parts of the CPU busy, and the instruction processing happens. Now, if you look at the overall time taken, if each stage still takes the same k milliseconds, then each instruction would take the same unit of time to process, which is 4k milliseconds, but the overall time taken for processing three instruction now reduces to 6k milliseconds. Notice that in the previous case, without pipelining, instructions used to take, the three instructions took 12k units of time to process. 
But with pipelining, we can accomplish the same task in 6K units of time. And this is a 50% increase in throughput, which is a significant jump. Let's look at some key facts about pipelining. First thing to keep in mind is pipelining is part of the hardware and it cannot be turned off. It is something that, it, that the CPU has designed in it from the ground up and there is no way to turn it off. And the only thing software engineering and programmers can do is know about the pipeline existing in the CPU and learn to design programs and work with the pipeline efficiently. Second, pipelining does not reduce the time taken to process one instruction, but what it does is increases the throughput of the processor by effectively using hardware. Keep in mind, only when a large number of instructions are processed, you will realize the benefits of the pipeline. The theoretical performance improvement of a pipeline is proportional to the number of stages in a pipeline. So if you have a four-stage pipeline, your performance increases by four times. And in practice, CPUs can have very deep pipelines. Almost 27 stages are known. Some CPUs have 27 stages, and they try to uh, break the instruction processing into very small steps and overlap the execution of different instructions to significantly increase the throughput of the CPU. More facts to keep in mind about pipelining. Increasing the number of stages typically increases performance, but increasing stages also increases the complexity of the CPU, requiring more hardware to implement it, and more hardware increases power consumption and consequently the heat dissipation of the CPU. So typically there's an upper limit to the depth of the pipeline, and practical performance that you can realize from some of these deep pipelines is well below the theoretical maximum. And the performance of the pipeline is significantly limited due to hazards or stalls in a pipeline. Ideally, instructions in a pipeline should move from one stage to another in each clock cycle to ensure smooth and efficient operation of the pipeline, which yields maximum efficiency and throughput. So if you look at a six stage pipeline, in each clock cycle, you would expect the instructions to move along the different stages of a pipeline to keep the pipeline operating smoothly and efficiently. However, in practice, there are hazards or stalls that prevent the pipeline from operating at maximum efficiency. These hazards or stalls are arise due to the nature of the programs that are run on these CPUs, and often they might force the pipeline to skip processing instructions in a given cycle. And some hazards require all the instructions that are in the pipeline to be discarded or flushed and new instructions to be loaded in order to ensure programs are operating correctly. Let's look at a few hazards that occur in a pipeline. There are three types of hazards. First one is called a data hazard that arises due to dependencies on results from one instruction to another, which is typically part of the program that is being run on the CPU. The second type of hazard is called a control hazard that arises due to branches or if statements, loops, method calls that are typically in programs, and these cause branching or change in the in set of instructions to be executed, and this causes what is known as a control hazard in a pipeline. The CPU can also have structural hazards which arise due to the limitations of hardware or speed of these components. Let's take a brief look at a data hazard. Consider these three instructions that are shown. The first instruction basically computes a result into a register EAX. The value of this register is used in the next instruction to update the value of EBX register. So there is an inherent dependency between the first and the second instruction and the second instruction cannot finish executing until the first instruction finishes. Also in this case, the first instruction is a division instruction that can take longer time to execute because it requires more clock cycles to do the division operation. So in order for the second instruction to proceed, it has to wait or stall for the first instruction to complete, and this introduces stalls or delays in the pipeline. Let's look at it from a graphical perspective. So as always, the instruction is, first instruction is fetched. While the first instruction is being decoded, the second instruction is being fetched from memory. 
the pipeline continues to operate. Instruction 1 starts exec executing the division operation. Instruction 2 is being decoded and the CPU knows it needs the result from the first instruction and it is fetching instruction 3 from memory. Unfortunately, our instruction 1 requires more clock cycles to execute, so instruction 2 does not have the result to use from instruction 1 and it has to stall and these stalls are illustrated as bubbles or circles in the pipeline. So instruction 2 and 3 have to wait until instruction 1 is done executing and instruction 1 may take several clock cycles to finish executing and these stalls propagate in the pipeline. So in this case, we have missed three cycles um, and the throughput of the pipeline is now impacted. Now finally, instruction 1, the division operation completes, the write back happens to get the result. That result can now be used by instruction 2, so it starts executing. And now that instruction 2 is moved on, instruction 3 moves into the decode phase. Then instruction 2 finishes, instruction 3 executes on the ALU, and then finally instruction 3 finishes. As you can see, there were three stalls in this pipeline that arise from the nature of the program that was executed on that pipeline. Similar to data hazards, control hazards arise due to branching in code and limit the overall throughput and performance that we can get from our pipeline processor. So for example, consider this program where there's an if statement. And if you look at a pipeline before the if statement is executed, the first instruction is computing the value of C by subtracting B from A. The second instruction is computing the value of D. The third instruction is going to compare C and D to figure out if an if needs to be taken. And by default, the CPU will continue to fetch the next set of instructions, which in this case is to add the value of C and B and any other instructions that, that are in the method. Now consider a scenario where the if returns true and the square root method needs to be called. In this situation, the CPU cannot process subsequent instructions, but instead it has to execute instructions for the square root method. So in this case, we first have to discard all of the instructions that are pending in the pipeline. They have to be flushed. So this is clearly loss of work that has already been done to fetch, decode, and do any other operations on these instructions. So this is kind of a wasted effort, and these instructions have to be discarded. Next, the CPU has to go back and fetch instructions associated with the square root method call. It has to go through cycle by cycle and fill up the pipeline, restoring the pipeline to the operations, and then the pipeline can continue to operate smoothly. Given that on an average, every eighth instruction is a branch, this can cause many hazards or stalls in the pipeline. The third type of hazard is a structural hazards, and structural hazards arise due to hardware limitations. This, the hardware limitations include uh, overheads of reading and writing data to RAM, and RAM is typically very slow. Uh, if we have only one ALU, then only one arithmetic or logic operation can be performed in a single clock cycle. And these types of hazards that arise from the way hardware works is called structural hazards, and they can prevent the pipeline from operating at maximum efficiency. There are several strategies that people use for reducing hazards in a pipeline. Here, it's a combination of hardware solutions which are implemented in the CPU, and also compilers work with the hardware to try and reduce hazards in a pipeline. For example, data hazards can be reduced by where the CPU uses a strategy called forwarding that uses hardware to pass results from one instruction to another, eliminating some of the write-back operations or not waiting for the write-back to complete. So it short-circuits the write-back operation. The compiler can sometimes reorder instructions in a program to reduce dependencies in the instruction, thereby reducing stalls or data hazards in the pipeline. Control hazards can, can be reduced by two strategies, uh, both hardware and software. Uh, the hardware strategy is that the CPU uses a branch prediction hardware to predict if a branch will be taken or not, and the CPU can guess pretty well whether a branch is taken based on the past behavior of these programs or instructions. And based on that, it decides which set of instructions to fetch 
and speculatively executes those instructions in a pipeline. The compiler can help by inlining methods. So when you inline methods, the body of the method is replicated wherever the call happens, thereby eliminating or avoiding method calls, reducing calls to typically short methods like getter methods where it's a one-line method. Those methods are typically inlined to avoid calls to those methods. The compiler can also unroll loops, uh, for loops, while loops by repeating the body to reduce the number of branches due to looping. Structural hazards are typically uh, arise due to hardware, so most of the structural hazard solutions are hardware driven. So for example, CPU uses CDs or tiers or caches to reduce latency to RAM to try and keep the pipeline operating smoothly with and reducing the number of stalls. Same way, some of the modern CPUs have superscalar operations where they have multiple ALUs or some of the ALUs are capable of single instruction, multiple data or SIMD operations to increase instruction level parallelism, thereby keeping the pipeline operating at maximum efficiency. Keep in mind these strategies do not eliminate all of the hazards in a pipeline. They only try and reduce or minimize the number of stalls. So in general, you will never realize the theoretical peak performance of a CPU in practice. So when we write programs, optimizing compilers, try and restructure the generated assembly or uh, machine instructions, knowing that there is a pipeline to try and make the pipeline operate at maximum efficiency and give us the best performance that we can get from the hardware.